there's this disconnect between I believe what Jesus did and I believe that he rose from the dead for the forgiveness of my sin and so someday, one day, I get to be with him in heaven and that is a cornerstone of the Christian faith. What we sometimes miss is that that is the future but there is power because of the resurrection today. That because of what Jesus accomplished and what we celebrate on Easter, that impacts my life on Monday and as I'm married and as I'm raising kids and as I go through my life, that makes a huge, huge difference. That that power is available. And so if you've ever wrestled with, man, why, I, I, I love Jesus, but why is it that I can't get over this habit or why do I keep falling back into this or why do I keep getting dragged into this? What we're going to do over the next several weeks is look at some encounters that people had face to face with God and how that changed their life radically. Because here's the promise, and here's kind of our key scripture for this whole series. I'm not exactly sure how it's going to, how long it's going to last, but here's the key: that Romans uh, chapter eight. This is the Apostle Paul speaking, and this is out of the Message paraphrase, which isn't a translation. It's kind of this 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 paraphrase. But I love the way that that he says this one particular thing. It stands to reason, doesn't it? that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life. In other words, if you cross that line of faith, well, he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus. In other words, think about how much power it must have taken for God to raise Jesus Christ from the dead. It would have taken a lot. And what the Apostle Paul is saying is that same power, not a diluted power, not a fraction of the power, that same power is actually available to you. When God lives in and breathes in you, and he does as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life. That that old part of you that struggles and and, and why do I, I know the right thing, but I just don't do it. Well, there's power available to you. With his spirit living in you, your body will be not in heaven someday, although that's true, but today and tomorrow and on the stressful days and on the frustrating days, your body will be alive as Christ. And so all over the scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, what we discover is men and women that had these extraordinary, extraordinary encounters with God. And that's what I want for you so badly. I want you to not just be a church attender, although that's a beautiful place to start, but I want you to move beyond that and have an encounter with a risen Jesus. He, he, he doesn't want you just to know him in your mind. He wants you to have this relationship. In your, the, uh, Moses, when he was uh, telling his story. Well, what would the Lord do? Well, he'd speak with Moses face to face. That's what I want for you, face to face, just as a man speaks with his friend. And for a lot of us, that's, that's foreign and, and distant to us, depending on what type of religious tradition you grew up in or didn't grow up in, depending on kind of how things work for you. We, we might have been taught that God is, is distant, and yeah, he did some neat things for people like David and for people like Noah and for people like Moses, but that was a long time ago, that was then. I'm living in the the real world now and I've got bills to pay and I got family to work through and I've got all these things that are going on in my life. The great news is for us though, that God hasn't changed. That the same God that met face to face with Moses and the same God that had those encounters with David, the same God that we read in the Old Testament and New Testament wants to be alive and present and working in your life today. And so if you've been to the place where you say, man, I, I do love God, I've just never felt close to God, this series is for you. The, I, I love God and I want to be connected, I just have never felt that closeness. What we're going to look at over the course of the series is several different examples that people interacted with God and how it changed their life. And again, the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians, is just as kind of a buildup. I'm trying to give you a little carrot. I'm trying to give you a little something to kind of get you excited about it. Whenever, though, they turn face, uh, to, uh, whenever, though, they turn to face God as Moses did, what does God do? He removes the veil, and there they are, and that's what we want for all of us, face to face. And they suddenly recognize that God is a living, personal presence. And maybe you've never felt that before. Maybe you've been a great church attender and you know when to stand, know when to sit, you know when to pray, you know when to do all the things. But it's never been personal. That's what God wants. If, that if you love God, the opportunity is God wants to be personal to you. Not this piece of chiseled stone. Not this place that you go to when I attend. I do. No, he wants to be personal. And when God is personally present, a living spirit, that old constricting legislation, man, it is recognized as obsolete. I don't have to do that anymore. We are free of it all 
of us. Nothing between us and God. Our face is shining with the brightness of his face, and so we are transfigured, much like the Messiah, our lives gradually. So it's not this light switch thing that just happens instantly. I can't promise you that. But gradually becoming brighter and brighter, more beautiful as God enters our lives, and we become like him. What does it look like to have an encounter with God? What does it look like that if God, if you want to work in my life, and if you want to be personal to me, then, then I'm open. You've, you've maybe read uh, books or seen documentaries, and maybe some of you are in this uh, field, I don't know, but if you read about people that have seen or met aliens, uh, or people that have, they're just 100% confident they've seen UFOs, and I'm not going to ask you for a show of hands if you think that you've seen a UFO in your life, but if you have, I would love to hear your story later. But if you go on to Wikipedia or just our friend Google, and if you Google close encounters with aliens, you will come up with all this extraordinary list of people that they are sure that they're sure that they're sure that they have had an encounter with an alien, and they don't care how dumb they look, and they don't care how, they, they just say, listen, I saw it, I experienced it, and I know that you don't believe me, but this thing happened to me. And that's, I think, what God wants to do for us. Because when it's just an explanation, when it's just me on a microphone talking, yeah, okay, I kind of buy it, but I'm not sure. I'm just telling you, when you can experience it, when it becomes real, when you have that encounter, people will come up to you and they'll say, well, what about this? And what I, I, I can't explain it. I just know that I have had an encounter. So here's a prayer that you can pray during this series. And some of you are new to prayer, and some of you, you're, maybe your prayer life isn't uh, active. This is a prayer that all of us, all of us can pray, regardless of where you're kind of at in your spiritual life. God, if there is more of you that you want me to experience, I'm open to that. You could pray that prayer. You, you might not even be sure that you believe the whole story. You're not even sure that you're ready to cross that line of faith. And you're here and you're just kind of questioning and wrestling. You can pray this prayer. God, if, if you're out there and if there's more of you that you want me to experience, I'm open to that. That I'm not going to shut you out and I'm not going to push you away. If you want to speak to me, if you want to interact with me, if you want to be personal to me, I am open to that. The psalmist David said, man, as a deer longs for flowing streams, God, I want to just long for you. I want to be thirsty for God. I want you to be it, it real and personal and face-to-face -face with me because I've tried the routine and I've tried going through the motions and it just doesn't really work. And so really quickly, before we get into our uh, story this morning, before we get into the scripture this morning, I want to give you three reasons I think that it's important for all of us, all of us. Why, why if you're going to have an encounter, why does it matter? Three things really quickly. That power, and this is hard for me to say because I like to preach, but power is better than preaching. That, that if you come to this church or, or to another church, and if you hear the most wonderful sermons you've ever heard, but it never drops into this personal, powerful relationship with Jesus, you've heard a bunch of words, but it hasn't really amounted to anything. Power is better than preaching. In other words, that just coming here and listening, and I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for coming in the wind. Most people didn't. But this is not that helpful. This is actually not that important unless it gets inside of your heart. If it's just in your mind and in your ears and not drop into a personal connection with God, well, we could have stayed home and done other things. The Apostle Paul, he recognized this. He says, I came to you in weakness, he's talking to this church in Corinth, in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching, well, they're not with persuasive words of wisdom, but well, why did it matter? Well, they were demonstrating the Spirit's power, that whatever I say is actually, man, if there's no power behind it, if you're not experiencing the power behind it, we could be just reading a book or, you know, we could be reading Shakespeare. It's, it's the power behind the words. Why did Paul want us to have power and not just powerful preaching? He says, well, so that your faith might be based on, not on human wisdom, but on God's power. That if you base your faith on my preaching, you will be so lacking. That, it, that if your faith is based on did Kyle preach good or did Kyle preach bad, it's going to be about 50-50, I would say, on any given week. But I'm just telling you, you're, you're missing out. And I'm so glad you're here and please come again. But there is more to it than that. So, so power is better than preaching, and encounters are better than explanations. Encounters, when I encounter God, 
personally, face to face. It, it goes beyond, I had to figure everything out in my mind. And I'm so pro you asking questions and wrestling and working through hard theological things. I am so pro that, and I'll introduce you to some resources that can help you with that. But as long as your relationship with God stays right here, and you've got to have everything explained, and you have to understand everything, and everything has to be just so perfectly and so put into this neat little box, you'll miss out. And you should ask questions. And I'm not saying that you should have this blind faith. The Bible does not uh, introduce us to this blind faith. There are hard questions, and there's answers to those questions. But at some point, you've got to go beyond just, I know this, or I'm not sure about this, and you've got to have, I've got to have this encounter. There's this great story, and John, you should read it for yourself. It's a hilarious story. But Jesus healed this man, and they were going back and forth. Well, is he really the person that was lame, and is he really healed? And so they ask all these questions, and they're doing all these interviews, and it's a really a pretty great story. It's in John chapter 9. And finally, the guy who had been healed just gave up, and he said, listen, you, you're, you're trying to get me to explain this, and you're trying to understand all the ins and the outs and how did it work. I don't know. And he says this, whether or not they're saying, well, Jesus, he's the sinner, and he couldn't do this. Read it for yourself. He says, I, I don't know, guys. Here's the one thing I do know. I was blind, and now I'm not blind. I can't answer all your questions. I just know I had an encounter. I can't answer all your questions. I just know that my life was this way, and now it's this way. And that's, I want that so much for you. I want so much for you to be able to say, I can't answer all the questions, and if you try to nail me down on this, I might not be able to give you great answers. I just know that I used to be this way, and now I'm different. I just know that my temper used to be like this, and now it's this way. I used to know that my marriage was on the rocks, and we weren't sure we were gonna make it, and now something is different. Something has changed. I fell in love with Brandy, not because I learned more things about Brandy, I fell in love with Brandy is because I experienced the personal relationship of Brandy. I, I was not on the fence saying, okay, she's got brown eyes and got brown hair and she's about five foot five. That information about Brandy is fine, it's true, but it doesn't make me fall in love with her. And if I wanna introduce you to Brandy, well, I'm not going to describe her as, okay, she's, she's wearing blue jeans today and all that. Here's what I wanna do. I want you to meet her because it's not in the information about her that makes you love her. It's in knowing her. The same is true with God. Yes, information is good and theology is so important. I, again, not saying just have this blind faith, but I'm saying you've got you've to meet him. You've got to know him. You've got to have an encounter with him. It's, it's just better. It's just better. Lastly, here's why I think that it's important we talk about it, then we're going to dive in this morning, that presence is better than practice. In other words, that even in a, in a church like this, that we're not like a traditional church, I wouldn't say, but even in our church, it'd be easy to get caught into the routine. I show up at 1015 and I sit in my chair and we stand and we do three songs and he's gonna say this and then we're gonna do this and we just get really comfortable. And I love a good routine. I love kind of knowing what's gonna happen. I think there's actually some benefits to that. But even in a church like this, that we can get really caught up in the practice that we miss the presence. That we say, okay, I know that I'm gonna sing three songs and then we're gonna sit down and then Kyle's gonna preach and then by 11.15 we're out and I can get a cup of coffee on my way out and we're all good and we're all fine. I'll see you next week or I'll see you in three weeks or when the lake's open, I'll see you sometime. It's just, it's just easy to get in that rhythm. But I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you, I've had an encounter I've had an experience, and I want so much for it for you, that presence is, is better. That when you open up your hands and you just pray, God, if there's more that you want for me, I'm open to that. If there's more of you that you want me to experience, I'm open to that. The psalmist said it this way, you reveal the path of life to me in your presence, not, not just in the, in the place, it's in God's presence. There's abundant joy at your right hand. There's connection, it's our eternal pleasures. They're just, it's, it happens in presence. And so let me get to it this morning. So, uh, Genesis chapter 32, if you have a Bible and if you want to follow along this morning, Genesis chapter 32 is where we're going to be. Some of you, if you're new to Bible study, if you're not sure how the, the, the scripture works, Genesis chapter 32 tells the story of a, a man named Jacob. And Jacob was, there was Abraham, and then there was Isaac, and then there was Jacob. And they were kind of this cornerstone 
of the Jewish faith. And Jacob had a twin brother named Esau, and they were always back and forth. They were always fighting, and Jacob was known to be a liar. He was known to be a deceiver. He was known to be a swindler. Even the, the, the story is that, that Jacob was second born, but even as Esau was being born first, Jacob grabbed onto his heel. That's what the word Jacob meant in this, in this language was heel grabber. And all through his life, he was kind of a mama's boy, and his brother Esau was this outdoorsman hunter. And you can read the story later for yourself in Genesis, but but he convinced Esau to give him his birthright, and then he stole his blessing because his dad Isaac was blind. And so Esau was infuriated, and so Jacob runs for his life, and he goes to a foreign land, and he gets he falls in love with it. This is the craziest story. You should read your Bibles. There's crazy stuff in there, guys. It's just really neat stuff in there. I can't imagine this. So he falls in love with this gal, and on the wedding night, you know, they they get married, and he wakes up in the next morning and realizes that his new father-in-law pulled a bait and switch on him and gave him the other sister to get married. And the other sister, again, it's in the Bible, you should read it for yourself, was not attractive. She was, she was kind of ugly, if we're just going to be honest with it. And so Jacob was here, and he's like, what's going on? I married the wrong person. How does it happen? We don't know for sure, but it happened. And so then he marries the gal that he really was falling in love with, and there's all this tension. It's a crazy story. And so where we pick it up in Genesis chapter 32 is that Jacob is heading back to his hometown, and he's hoping to make amends with his brother. And he's really, really scared. He's worried that his brother has held on to a grudge and that he's going to kill him. And so there's, there's all of this tension. There's all of this chaos. And we pick up the story in Genesis chapter 32 when Jacob meets God. When Jacob has this encounter and his life from this moment on is changed. Why are we here this morning? I want your life to be changed. I, I want you to experience the power that raised Christ from the dead. And I want it to be alive and working in your life because you've got a difficult life and you've got some things coming up down the road that are hard to deal with and you've got stress and you've got chaos and you've got all these things going on in your life and God's available and God wants to speak with you and God wants to have an encounter with you. Here's the story and then we'll pick out a few things from it and then we'll be done for the day. That night Jacob got up and took his two wives, the ugly one and the pretty one, his two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of Jabbok. And as he sent them across the stream, he sent, them, he sent over all of his possessions. So he's heading that way. He's going to move. He's really hopeful that Esau is going to receive these gifts, and he's going to be, you know, not so raging mad. So Jacob was left all alone and a man. Now, this is what we call, we don't exactly know who this person was. Some theologians think that it was an angel. Some people think that it was God himself. Some people think in theology, what we call a Christophany. And a Christophany is that it's Jesus coming to earth for these little moments. So we think that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, there was that fourth one, you remember the story? That that fourth one was, was Jesus. There was never a time when Jesus wasn't. There was just the incarnation, what we celebrate at Christmas. But there's never a time that Jesus wasn't. And so a lot of theologians think that this, is, this man was, was Jesus. This was another Christophany where Jesus came to earth. We're not for sure exactly. But it was, a, it was some kind of spiritual heavenly person. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. And when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. And the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, not going to do it. I will not let you go unless you bless me. And the man asked him, what's your name? Jacob. He answered, and the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. And Jacob said, well, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? And then he blessed him there. And so Jacob called the place Peniel because saying it is because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel and he was limping because of his hip. How do we have an experience with God? How do you have an experience with God? I can't, I can't uh, explain it really, really well, but I can just show you what happened to Jacob. And maybe this would be something that would be helpful for you. The first one is this, you've got to be willing to submit. 
You gotta be willing to submit. At some point, you have to decide my life is going to be in submission to what God wants for me. That some of us have been wrestling with God and that we have been fighting because we know God is calling me to move in this direction and I just don't want to do it. God is telling me this is not right for me to be doing this and I just, I just enjoy it so much. And so there is this wrestling back and forth. God's call and my desire and God's uh, vision for my life and my vision for my life. And there's this, there's this wrestling. If you're gonna have an encounter with God, if that same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is gonna be alive and working in you, you've gotta be willing to, I, God, I'm done wrestling with you. I'm done with because the the amount of victory that you can have in your life is in direct connection to the amount of submission in your life. That the, the the more I submit myself to God, the more God is able to work in my life. That I can't conquer a lot of what's coming up in my life until I allow God to, for lack of a better word, conquer me. That God, I am willing to bow my knee. I'm I, I'm done wrestling with you. I'm done fighting back and forth you. James, the brother of Jesus, he said it this way, hey, submit to God. That's what we all have to do at some point in our lives. We, God, my life is in your hands. I'm not just trusting you for heaven someday, one day, somewhere in the future, but on Monday, I'm gonna submit to you. And on Tuesday, I'm gonna submit. And my marriage, I'm gonna submit. And my money, I'm gonna submit. And my kids, I'm gonna submit. Every part of me, God, I'm done wrestling with it. Resist the devil, and he's gonna flee for you. Draw near to God, and he's gonna draw near for you. Cleanse your hands, sinners. Purify your hearts because we're double-minded. I know what God wants, I just don't wanna do it. We're, we're back and forth. Be miserable and mourn and, and weep. We, we, in other words, recognize, I've went my own way. I've been wrestling with God. I've been moving in a direction that I know God doesn't want. And so recognize that. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. In other words, let's not pat ourselves on the back. Let's not say, hey, I'm fine, it's all good, I'll do whatever I want, and someday heaven will be for me and it'll all take, no, 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 recognize, I've been wrestling with God, I've been trying to have God and me, I've been trying to have it both ways, and it's not been working. I, I, I'm struggling with God, I've gotta, I've gotta put down the struggle, humble yourselves. Humble yourselves, God, I'm going your way. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and what's gonna happen? He will exalt you. The message translation of that verse, I love it. He says, get down on your knees before the master. It's the only way you're gonna get on your feet. And some of us have been trying, and we've been so confused. Why have I been struggling so much in this area? Why can't I get over this? It could be, it could be. Are you wrestling with God? Are, are, are you trying to have it both ways? Have you gotten down on your knees and saying, God, every part of my life, Every part of my life, it's for you. And I don't want to wrestle with you anymore. Here's a question that you should ask yourself. Are you and God, are you and God in a wrestling match? And are you getting tired of it? Are, are you getting worn out? Do you know this is what God wants, but this is what I want, and we're just fighting back and forth? Do you know that God is leading you to something, or God is leading you away from something, but you're just not willing to let it go? You're not willing to forgive? You're not willing to say no? You're not willing to make the change? If you wanna have an encounter with God, if you want God to work powerfully in your life, it has to, I've gotta stop wrestling. I've gotta stop wrestling because I know, I, and I know it's hard. It's hard to let go, but I'm just telling you there's freedom on the other side of submission. There's freedom for your life. There's freedom from your past. There's freedom from bondage. There's freedom from all sorts of things. As you submit, as you say, I'm going to place myself underneath the mighty hand of God, not just for heaven someday, because we all want that, but today, God, what do you want? I'm gonna submit to you. Here's the second thing, that we, that we stop wrestling and we go ahead and submit, and then I, I stop fighting, but I, but I keep holding. So you see the story that, that Jacob had his hip touched, and he stopped wrestling with him, but he kept holding on to them, and he said, I'm not gonna let you go. He, he was defeated. But he said, God, I'm not going to, to let you go. And for some of us, that's where we've gotta be. That you are considering, I'm not sure that this whole thing is worth it. I'm not sure I'm gonna keep going. I think God should have done this and 
I think he should have answered this prayer and my life isn't working the way that I thought it was going to work and I'm reaching for the door of faith and saying, God, see you later. I'm gonna do life on my own. Kind of just like Jacob, would you just keep holding on? Would you just stop your wrestling and just say, God, I'm just gonna hold on to you as best as I can. I'm gonna hold on to you. I'm not gonna let you go. And though the, the, the things that are happening in my life, maybe I wouldn't have picked them, and maybe it's difficult, and maybe I don't understand, God, I'm just gonna keep holding on to you. It's in the holding. It's in the holding where we get to know God. Some person said that, that we, we enjoy God on the mountaintops, but man, we really get to know God in the valleys. It's oftentimes in the valleys, in those difficult times where we say, God, it doesn't feel like you're holding on to me and so I'm not gonna hold on to you. It doesn't feel like you're close to me and so I don't wanna get close to you. Can you just do like Jacob and just say, God, I, I'm not gonna let you go. Here's the, the third one. We're gonna stop wrestling. We're gonna keep holding and then I'm gonna get a new identity. The man asked Jacob, what's, what's your name? Well, my name's, my name's Jacob. I'm the heel grabber. I'm the deceiver, I'm the schemer, I'm the, I'm the trickster, I'm the man that lied to my father, I'm the one that cheated my brother, I'm the one that manipulated my father-in-law. I, I, everywhere I've went is disaster. This is just who I am. And some of us have an identity, right? Some of us, when we, we look at our past and we look at ourselves, well, I'm just the one that's just full, full of anxiety. I'm just the one that I can never get ahead. I'm just the one that things are always gonna be like this. This marriage is never gonna work. My kids are never going to turn around. I'm always gonna be in this kind of dead-end job. This is, just, this is just who I am. And God says, well, what's your name? And we can give them all these reasons that we can't and all these reasons that things aren't going. And God just comes around and says, here's, here's your new identity. You're going to be, for Jacob, you're gonna be Israel. Do you know what Israel means? God rules. So he went from a deceiver, a heel grabber, a manipulator, says, God rules in my life. And I want so much for you to just get this new identity, that who I am yesterday doesn't have to be who I am going forward. That what labels I've put on myself, what labels other people have put on me, the choices that I've made, all of these things that have been surrounding me up to this point, I am new because of what Jesus has done. The Apostle Paul in Galatians says, I have been crucified with Christ. In other words, I have came to faith in Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ that lives in me. So that old, that's, that's why we baptize people. Dead to sin, alive in Christ. That you are new. You're new. Something changed on the inside of you. The life I now live, uh, the, the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. For some of us, we've got to step into, I'm not what my past says I am. And I'm not what this other person says that I am. And I'm not what my ex says I am. And I'm not even what the, the decisions up to this point in my life say I am. I'm who God says I am. That I am chosen, I am loved, that I have a hope and I have a future in him. That he's called me according to his purpose. That I have everything I need to do everything that God's called me to do. And no matter what anybody else says about me, God has made me new. The prophet Isaiah said, hey, don't remember the past events. Pay no attention to the things of old. Because, man, as long as you're just tied back to your past and what other people have said, it just robs you of your future. He says, look, I'm, I'm about to do something new. Even now, it's coming. Don't you see it? Indeed, I'm gonna make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The, 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 the you from before doesn't have to be the you of tomorrow. That God wants to do something in your life. And we have to grab it by faith and say, God, just like Jacob, who was a deceiver and a manipulator and left chaos everywhere he went, and he moved forward into this future that's extraordinary, and God used him in, in miraculous ways. And his life up to this point wasn't perfect, and going forward it wasn't perfect. And he ha still had some struggles, and he still had some hiccups, but he, he had this new identity. And until you get God's identity in your life, it's just always gonna be a struggle. It's just always gonna be, well, this is just, this is who I am. Well, that, I, who does God say you are? Does God say you're loved? Well, then you're loved. Does God say you're redeemed? Well, then you're redeemed. Does God say that he has a plan and a purpose for your life? Then he does. Does God say you're forgiven? Well, then you are. You do not have to be held back. I don't have to be held back by what happened, by what I did, by what happened to me that was no fault of my own. I can become alive in Christ with 
a new identity. Here's the last one, and then we're gonna be done for the day, that we move forward in weakness. And this seems counterintuitive. So no, 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 I, I, I gotta move forward in strength. I, I, I've got a new identity. I've got this new, because of what Jesus has done, this is who I am. Now I'm strong, and now I'm gonna go, and I'm gonna fight, and I'm really gonna work hard, and now I'm really going to do it. No, 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 no. We gotta move forward in weakness. And, and again, we're Americans, and we want us to all, we wanna just be able to do it all on our own. We say, I should be strong enough to handle this. I should be strong enough to, to not get caught back up into this habit. I should be strong enough to not slip back into this. I should be strong enough to, to be able to kick this addiction on my own. I should be strong enough. But what, what the scripture invites us to is that we move forward not in my strength, but I move forward, I recognize my weakness. That Jacob, from that moment, he, he walked forward with that limp. He walked forward, man, I, I, I can't do all the things that I, I used to do. And what was it a reminder of? This is what I wanna leave us with this morning. The reminder of Jacob's limp was that God is stronger than me and God is with me. That's the reminder. That as I walk through life with this limp, I wrestled with God and I lost. God was stronger. And, well, he's with me. And he's never left me. And there's never been a moment where he hasn't been with me. There's never been a moment where he won't be with me. And my limp is a reminder, God's stronger and God's with me. There's this great story, one of my favorite uh, passages of scripture in, in Romans. This is the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul was this wonderful, wonderful man. And we don't know exactly what it was. He called it a thorn in his flesh. And it was this thing that, that kept him from doing all the things that he, he wanted to do. And so Paul did exactly what we did. He prayed. He said, God, please. He said, in fact, three times I pleaded. It wasn't like this, now I lay me down to sleep prayer. It was, God, please take this away from me. Have you prayed that before? God, please take away this desire. God, please take away this anxiety. God, please take away this depression. God, please take away this stress and this confusion. And it just feels like you're not getting anywhere. You've got a friend in Paul because three times I pleaded with God, please take it away. And God's answer was no, no. And that's kind of discouraging. Because I mean, we think Paul, he, this is Paul. I mean, he wrote like a third of the New Testament. He planted churches all over. So much of our theology and so much about, we know, about what we know of God comes from Paul. Paul prayed for other people and they were healed. And yet when he prayed for himself, he, God said no. But God said no, but. My grace, I'm not gonna do that, Paul. I, I'm not going to do what you think would make your life better. I'm gonna do something that's ultimately better. My grace is sufficient for you. So Paul, you're gonna keep the thorn, but you're gonna have my grace. You're gonna keep that struggle, but you're gonna ha have a deep understanding that my grace is with you. My power is made perfect in weakness. That Paul, if you just had all of the strength, you, there might be a part of you that thinks, I'm doing this on my own. That I've got this on my own. And there's going to be a part of you that's tempted to, to move away from God because I'm so strong in and of myself. But Paul, I want you to recognize there's some weakness in you and through your weakness, you're going to learn to rely on me. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, here's what Paul said. He got to the place where he stopped praying about it and he said, I'm gonna boast all the more gladly about my weakness. Hey, you see this thorn in my flesh? I'm glad it's here. That's what Paul's saying. I'm glad that God did what God did. I'm glad that God didn't do what God didn't do. I'm gonna boast in my weakness. Why? So that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in my weakness. And you might be a long ways from there, and I'll be honest, there's some areas of my life that I, I don't know that I'm delighting in my weakness. I don't know that I'm cheering for my weakness, but I, I, I can rely on God's strength in my weakness, in insults, in hardships, in, in persecutions, in difficulties, in anxiety, in stress, in a marriage that's just not working, in kids that will not listen, in all of these money problems, all this, whatever it is that, that you're saying, God, would you please, would you please, would you please help me with this? When I'm weak, then 
I'm strong. In other words, it's just this posture that just says, God, I don't got this. And I know that I want to be able to say, God, I've got this. You can count on me, and I'm strong enough, and I'm going to be able to do it. God, look at me. I'm going to do such a good job, and I'm going to make the right choices. It just comes in, God, I don't have this. On Monday when I go to work, I don't have this. I've, I've been stressed, and I've been in chaos, and I'm not getting along with this person, and I don't know how it's going to be solved. God, I don't have this. So I need your grace. Your grace is sufficient for me. And God, when I go home, when we leave this little auditorium, and when I go into that house that's a little chilly, a little tense, things aren't going well, and we've, there's some friction, your grace is there. And God, I don't got this. And I've tried all the things that I know how to try, and so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna move forward in weakness. I'm gonna move forward trusting that your grace is sufficient. Lord, I, this is, here's the prayer. Lord, I need you. I need you. I, I don't got this. And we can be reminded, just like Jacob, God is stronger than me and God's with me. That God's stronger than whatever it is I'm going through and he's with me as I'm going through it. And sometimes in God's miraculous provision, he will totally wipe things out and change things and give you new desires and give you these, these miraculous events in your life. And I'm so grateful. And I'll pray with you. I'll pray for you that God would do that. It'd be my honor to pray. And sometimes God says, no, I'm not gonna do that, but my grace is there. No, I'm not gonna wipe this out, but my grace is sufficient. And that we can be like Paul and say, God, I need you. Your strength is made perfect in my weakness. And so as we finish up today, here's my encouragement to you. If you wanna have an encounter with God, if, if you wanna go beyond just the Sunday morning routine, if you want the power of the cross to be evident and real in your life, some of you gotta stop wrestling, stop wrestling. Just submit. You, aren't, you, aren't you worn out? Aren't you tired of wrestling? Aren't you tired of fighting back and forth with God saying, God, I really want this. Just go and submit. And in the submission, hold on to him, hold on to him. Recognize who God says you are and live out that new identity. And then as you move forward from, from this place, tomorrow and Thursday and Friday and next Sunday and into the summer and whatever it's gonna be, your strength, your strength is made perfect in my weakness. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that your word has been preserved for us, for our good, so that we can learn and grow, Lord, so that we can be convicted so that we can uh, have a light shown into our heart to show us where we need to change and where we need to repent and where we need to uh, move forward. So Lord, I'm praying for that in, in my life. I'm praying for that in the lives of those that are here and those that are watching online, that, that your words would not just be inspirational, but they would be life-changing. Lord, I'm praying that for all of us, that we would have an encounter with the living God that the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead would be alive in us, that we would have an encounter that we can't explain. We just like that blind man said, I don't know how to explain it. I just know that I am different than what I was because we met with you. And so Lord, I'm praying as we go into this week that you would give us the faith to stop wrestling. You would give us the faith to hold on to you. You would help us to understand who we are in you and then in our weakness, your strength would be made perfect. Thank you, Lord, that you're stronger than us. Thank you that you're with us. It's your name that we pray, amen.